Hey there. When was the last time you opened your home? Not because it was your turn to host a holiday gathering or you saw a really cool party idea on Pinterest. That's me never. Or you were celebrating <laughs> one of your kids' birthdays or you just wanted to play games with your friends. When was the last time you opened your home? Not for one of those reasons, but because you simply felt the nudge of God's spirit to do it. If it's been a while or if that's never happened, this episode of Grounded is for you. I'm Dana Gresh. Mm. And I'm Aaron Davis. And we tell you every week we're here to give you hope and perspective. We think you need some perspective. We think the church needs some perspective on an idea that's not a new idea. It's been around for a long time, but it seems to have fallen on hard times lately. I think we could blame the pandemic, which shall not be named, in part. But uh, <laughs> what we're talking about here is true biblical hospitality. I think those qualifier words are important because we can sometimes have ideas about hospitality that aren't true or biblical. Yeah. And that's why we're having this episode today. But even just the yep. word hospitality, that might have caused you to panic. And I get that. <laughs> yeah. There are some pe people, some women, we're primarily speaking to women that just feel like that is not my gift. And they get hives just at the thought of having somebody over. So if that's you, before you get nervous, uh, we are going to tell you what this is not. This is not about making sure that your home looks like something that Joanna Gaines may have designed. It's not about that at all. <laughs> I am so thankful for that because mine would be the Joanna Gaines before photograph. <laughs> well, I think you have a beautiful home, but she's moved on past farmhouse style, which you live in an actual farm. So yes. you might be. Mine would be um, Joanna was here. We see some touches but so were the Davis boys. Like, you know, Jason will frequently say to me, baby, we can have these kids or we can have nice things. And uh, we gleefully choose the first option, uh, but it is a trade-off. Yeah, it is a good trade-off. Hospitality is much bigger than being Pinterest perfect, thankfully. Amen. And when you hear the definition I'll share in just well, about two minutes, I think it'll make you not only understand that it's not about Pinterest perfect pictures, but yep. it'll also, this definition will cause you to deeply desire to be a conduit of biblical hospitality this year. Because listen to me clearly, hospitality is among many things clearly assigned to us in the context of end times ethics mm. or preparing the way for Jesus to come again. That's me Mike, I'm dropping my mic, Dana, mic because drop. that is good <laughs> stuff. It's actually not about any of the things we make it out to be. And I I believe you're, and I'm passionate about it, but I'm going to make sure you're going to give us biblical evidence, right? Oh, I will. I, I'll help you see the of connection course. when we get grounded in God's word in a little bit. I knew you would. Uh, this is a pared down episode. It's just going to be Dana and I talking. Because really, this is a, a, a fr conversation that needs to happen friend to friend. It doesn't need to be something that we bring in an expert for. Yeah. Um, it just needs to be, you know, friend to friend talk. Friend to friend around the table. Um, yeah. This whole thing, this program started with an ep a sermon I heard last year, and I immediately emailed Aaron, and I said, my pastor just knocked the ball out of the park with a challenge from First Peter to be mm. hospitable. But basically, my pastor Jared was trying to shift our thinking and help us see the difference between entertainment, a trap he says some Christians have fallen into, and yeah. biblical hospitality. And when I put my own hosting through this biblical filter, I realized that I was prone to do the first, entertaining, often, and to do mm. the latter, hospitality, biblical hospitality, infrequently. So seeing the difference and responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit has been such a peace producing game changer for me. And I'm even going to tell you about a test God gave me recently that proved I'm actually learning the difference. Ooh, I don't know what you're going to share with us. That's exciting. This is a passion of Dana and I, and I believe it will become a passion of yours. But I was just recently introduced to T-charts. I don't know where these have been all my life, but you just put a T on a piece of paper. You put one thing's on one category, one thing's on the other. Maybe you want to do that for hospitality, biblical hospitality versus entertainment, because it's going to help your heart if you know the difference. Uh, I mm -hmm. wonder how the rest of us will do when we put our hosting through this filter that Dana's going to share with us. So uh, my heart really is on fire about this. I believe 
uh, this is part of the Great Commission, and it's a part, and we're missing out on some tremendous opportunities by not fulfilling it. Slow down, Aaron. Wait for a minute. Okay, but I'm just excited about it. And so I have it on my mind to share three reasons why the church must respond, return to hospitality. We can't, mm. we can't let it go the way of COVID. Um, we've got to fight back to get Christian hospitality in our lives. And we want you to know that Portia would have loved to have been a part of this conversation. She's not with us today, but you can stand in at her place. We want to hear from you. You don't even have to throw your shoe. That's a Portia-ism, but you can if you want to. We just want you to use the chat, use the comments, and we always lean on you to share these episodes. Who do you know that does this really well and you want to affirm them in that? Yeah. Who do you know that maybe needs a new grid for hospitality? Hit that share button, text it. You know what to do. And then I want you to stay with us for the whole episode. We know that some of y'all click out partway through. We get it. You got busy lives. But uh, we're going to give a big announcement at the end of this episode. And Dana, when you sent me the idea for this episode, you didn't know about this. We've been keeping it under wraps. But it's one of those amazing things God does with the Grounded team to show us that he is the one in charge of Grounded. So uh, you're not going to want to miss it. All right, Dana, define hospitality for us. I'm ready. I know we're going to 1 Peter 4, and yep. uh, I'm going to make my T-chart, got my paper mate flair, and I'm ready <laughs> okay. to learn from you. I think everybody could use one of those T-charts today. It would be very helpful. Put hospitality on one side, entertainment on the other. Okay, let's define hospitality. Hospitality was, and I think it is, one of the great virtues. Vir hospitality was and is one of the great virtues of the Bible. It's mentioned a whole lot. Um, the ancient Hebrews believed that each person that came their way was sent by God. So hospitality was, in their minds, a sacred task. And it could even be said that the person you were serving was God Himself. They kind of had that kind of. Uh, expectation. After all, Abraham had that mindset. And it, as it turns out, Genesis 18 records the patriarch was, in fact, hosting God in when he hosted the three guests. Well, Jesus invoked this virtue into Christian times when he said this. It's recorded in Matthew 10. You know this. Whoever receives you, receives me. So from a biblical point of view, the virtue of hospitality is far more than being a good host at a dinner party. It's not entertaining people. Are you ready for my definition? Leaning in. Hospitality is the act of encountering the presence of God in, with, and through others. All right. With that definition in your mind, let's read 1 Peter um, 4. 7 to 11. Now, before I read it, let me give you some context. What I'm about to read is a continuation of Peter's grander point on setting our minds to suffer like Christ mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 4. Now, that command was issued to believers in a fallen world surrounded by those who hate them and who hate Jesus. Now, I don't have to say this, but does that sound a little bit like our anti-Christian world today? Well, then... Paul, Peter picks up, Paul writes so much. He always is in my brain. Peter picks up with, um, in verse five, turning our attention to the final judgment, a day when the Lord Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. So he's combining all of that. And then we get to verse seven. Let's start reading. The end of all things is at hand. So there he is again, bringing up the end times, right? Another reference to that. And this sense of urgency here that as we draw closer to the day of Christ's return, hospitality becomes increasingly more important, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, 1 Peter 4, 7. At the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And here's where we get to hospitality in verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I'm not even going to preach a sermon on without grumbling because it kind of does it itself, doesn't it? And then it goes on. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplied in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 
Okay, so Peter says that as the day of Christ's return draws near, and I don't know how near it is, I know we're one day closer than we were yesterday, and as that day draws near, we must show hospitality. Now, remember my definition. Hospitality is the act of encountering the presence of God in, with, and through others. So Peter writes that each of our spiritual gifts should be used as we serve one another when biblical hospitality is happening. That's what he says. is like, if you're going to speak, let it be an oracle of God. If you're going to serve, let it be the strength of God. All right. And he is saying, God has given you gifts to do those things. What gifts? Well, I think it's easy that we could make the shift to our spiritual gifts, sharing biblical spiritual, sharing Biblical spirit filled. Oh, I can't say that word today. Sharing biblical spirit filled wisdom. That's one of the gifts of the spirit, right? Depositing an increase of faith. Faith is a spiritual gift. Experiencing and expressing the gifts of healing, like helps and prayer and faith again. Experiencing and expressing or testifying about the gift of miracles. How many times do you sit down at a dinner table and express the way God has miraculously worked in your life? Maybe it's sharing a love for and a quest to understand prophecy, this end time stuff. I mean, this would be a great place to start that conversation with this passage, right? Or could be um, stirring up spiritual discernment as we talk and share and learn about what's going on in each other's lives. Now, right there, I just want to take uh, let's let's take a full stop right there. Those are just a few of the spiritual gifts we read about in our Bibles. But this list does not sound like your average dinner party, does it? <laughs> no, not most of them. And if those things aren't present, your dinner party is just average entertaining. Mm, ouch. Did that crunch your big toe? Because it crunched mine. Now, I'm not saying that all those things need to be present when we're practicing biblical hospitality, but the thing is, our hearts need to be pointing to Jesus when we invite people over for dinner, if we want to call it hospitality in the biblical sense. So instead of pulling out our board games, what if we pulled out our Bibles? Now, I got to say, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the board game at all. There are plenty of them in the Gresh house, and we love them. If those other things are included at some point, if you are stirring up faith, if you are talking about the miraculous way Jesus has worked in your life, if you are giving someone some prayer and faith for an, a journey of healing that's happening in their body. I got to tell you what my pastor preached on this message. He stepped on all the toes on all my feet the day he shared, because right off the bat, I realized I'm an entertainer most of the time. And I'm doing it thinking I'm practicing biblical hospitality. And I want to be known as a woman who has biblical hospitality as a mark of her life. As if that were not enough. After he stepped on all my toes, then my pastor went on to give kind of a test to help us figure out if we're just entertaining or we're offering biblical entertainment in our homes. And he said, here's your review. You're going to need that T-chart in your mind. One side says entertainment. One side says hospitality. All right. Entertainment is all about me, my house, my things. And we do get pretty Pinterest perfect obsessed. Hospitality is all about others their needs, and God's ability to provide for them. Entertainment is stressful because it's so dependent on me, me, me. Hospitality is peaceful because it's dependent on God's presence. Entertainment is usually very Pinterest perfect and scheduled. Ah, what a nice thing to have it scheduled ahead of, ahead of time in advance. Hospitality is usually very messy and inconvenient, often last minute. Can somebody in the back row say amen? <laughs> Entertainment leaves me tired when I'm left to clean up the mess at the end of the night. But hospitality, it leaves me refreshed and energized because of the presence of God. I understand the importance of the mess that we just made. Hmm. So I just kind of wonder, how'd you do on that test? Are you just entertaining? Or is yours a home where people are experiencing true biblical hospitality? Aaron? Uh, 
I was listening and working on my T chart. I couldn't heart quite keep up with it, but I got the big idea and I super <laughs> appreciate it. And uh, I've been entertaining. So you mm. said that in the open that you were going to share how you have two tests that revealed you're learning the difference between entertainment and hospitality. Can you give us those tests? Because if you said yeah, them, I they're them. just <clears throat> they're just hot on the pavement of life experiences that I've had because um, I, I love opening the word in my home. I love testifying mm, about Jesus and glorifying him. Bob and I actually have an ottoman that we bought just to pray for people. It's this round, cushy ottoman that we sit mm. people on. We pray for them. We put them in it. We lay hands on them. But one area where I really failed the entertainment versus biblical hospitality is entertainment is Pinterest perfect and scheduled, but hospitality yeah. is messy and inconvenient and often last minute. I am prone to be inflexible. <laughs> I am a very scheduled person. My husband, on the other hand, is prone to be responsive to people's needs. So mm. I started praying for God to make me like that, to throw out my schedule when there was an opportunity, because I think biblical hospitality is inconvenient. I'm convinced of yeah. it. When someone yeah. has a need, we rise up and meet it. So these are the two tests. Recently, we have a friend going through a hard time in his marriage. I came home one night to cook dinner for my daughter and her fiance who were coming over. Bob was in the living room advising and providing wisdom for this man. And mm. um, I'm in the kitchen praying for them. And right before my daughter arrived, I sensed God's spirit having me open my table to this. You know, I wanted a private night with my daughter and fiance, sure. but the Lord is saying, Hey, this guy needs you. And so when Bob texted, is there room for, and he typed this name's friend, I said, yes. And here's the key, Aaron. I did it joyfully. Somebody mm. throw a shoe. Portia is not here. <laughs> Somebody has got to show a shoe, throw a shoe. It was a win. And it was the same kind of thing. Just Monday night. Uh, we have a guest in our home who's staying here short term. And so I was making spaghetti, just made just enough kind of for the three of us. And then a coworker called and she was feeling lonely, having a hard night. She's a single woman. I was like, come on over. And then we have our bus driver was out helping Bob on the, on the, in the barn. And I knew, mm. I knew when he drove up to help Bob, I got to stretch this meal of three to five. Mm. And I did it with. I loved it. I enjoyed yeah. it. I didn't have a grumbling heart. Those were two big mm. wins because I'm starting to practice biblical hospitality instead of schedule convenient and picture yeah. perfect entertainment. So as, mm. a, as a type A uh, schedule girl myself, I get it. And you know what? The, God can use those personality ter temperaments to accomplish a lot. God isn't asking you to have a personality transplant in order to... Right be who he called you to be, but a willingness to adjust, to change your plans and to do it joyfully. Actually, first Peter did tell us to do it without grumbling, without um, grumbling, without grumbling. So oh, Aaron, really I good. think you are one of the hostess with the mostest last year. Uh, we all, the whole grounded team came out there and we recorded some of your podcast, the deep well podcast. Yeah. And, um, you put out some, some, some feasts for us. <laughs> well, I'm night. a foodie. Like, so you put out some feasts, but you just said you felt a little bit convicted by my pastor's test that you might be an entertainer. Mm -hmm. Please tell me because I don't yeah. see that. I actually Lord's... had to put a sign in my kitchen that said people over projects, because mm -hmm. if I'm not careful, even entertaining, even blessing people can become a project to me. And then it's becomes about, you know, just checking the things off of the list and, Actually, that doesn't make people feel very comfortable. And yeah. for years, I wanted people to actually just pull on to the Davis property. And whether they are aware of it or not, I wanted something in their spirit, in their heart to go, oh, that's better. Yeah, and I want different. that's the spirit of, yeah, that's the spirit of yeah. God that does that. But me being um, rigid or having standards that have nothing to do with um, everything to do with their palate and nothing to do with their heart. I think yeah. is where I feel the conviction. Well, that goes there. back so. to my pastor's test of that entertainment is all about me, my stuff, my food Truly. and a Truly. true biblical hospitality is about others and their needs and God's ability to provide them. So, yeah. yeah. So maybe here's a third test. If they leave your home and they can't remember what you made for dinner and they can't <laughs> rattle off uh, how beautiful your table was, but their heart was ministered to, they have yeah. fresh, enthusiasm they can 
you know, they don't feel as lonely. They can face the crisis in the marriage for, better than they were before. Yeah. That's really the goal. And so it's that, um, not being me focused, but being others focused that yeah. where I felt the conviction. So appreciate that. Well, message Aaron, so we much. said we both wanted to take a stab at getting us grounded on God's word on this topic yep. today because we both have so much in our heart. So would you right. take us back to God's word, take us to this topic of biblical hospitality from a different angle, the one that God's laid on your heart? Happy to. It's a, a double header of sorts, two teachers here on Grounded. Um, how's this for a headline? We do like to read the headlines on occasionally here on on occasion here on Grounded. Whatever happened to hospitality? That's the headline. And I hope you'll catch the tagline underneath it. It says, even in churches, many believers feel safer ignoring those they don't know. I mean, aren't we seeing this on a cultural level? There's no such thing as door-to-door -door salesmen. There's no such thing as um, rogue sales calls because people don't put up with it. And we might be grateful for those things, but the idea is stay at arm's length. I'm not sure it's safe to invite you into my home. And have you ever been the one who shies away from saying hi to someone new or someone old or maybe anyone at a congregational gathering? You know, at my own church, which I love, we actually gave up the part of the sermon or the service where the pastors would say, turn to your neighbor and say something. And um, I noticed it and I wrote what I hope was a kind email to my pastors and said, hey, can we bring that back? Because I don't know how new people can meet anybody if we don't have it. I mean, they're not just going to insert themselves into a conversation in the lobby and they haven't. They said what they heard from new people is they didn't really like that part of the service. But I think we got to get back to it. Social anxiety is at an all-time high. And have you noticed we're not really gathering much anymore? And we think that's a big deal here on Grounded. Today, I want to call you the church to help the church uh, do a Dana word. Dana uses this a lot. A reset, because we need a reset in the area of hospitality and I'm going to give us some specific reasons, three reasons why we need, this is an optional church, why we need to be hospitable. I'm going to read us John 21, 1 through 14. I'm going to tell you in advance, it's a long passage, but it's a beautiful story and one of my favorites. So you got to know the context. The resurrection had recently occurred. So um, we find the disciples kind of in the uh, haze of all of that in verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So what we just read is insult to injury. They're hurting. Things are unraveling very quickly. Yes, Jesus is alive, but is he coming to establish the kingdom? They don't know. And so they go back to what they know. Many of the men in this boat were fishermen by trade, and they can't catch a single fish. I'll pick it up at verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? Of course, he knew the answer. They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it out and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. I'm at verse seven. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. That disciple, by the way, is John. He writes about himself that way in the book of John. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. You're like, Aaron, where's the hospitality? Here it is. Verse nine. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask them, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
Well, uh, you probably have heard sermons preached on this. We tend to focus on Peter, the interaction with Jesus, and um, the fact that he gives Peter the opportunity to repent three times as he denied him three times. But I don't want you to miss that, that invitation to join him on the shore. I don't want you to miss the charcoal fire that he had prepared. I don't want you to miss that he already had fish cooking. He certainly didn't need the fish that they caught. And I don't want you to miss that he had warm bread ready for them to eat for breakfast. Jesus didn't invite anyone into his home in this passage. It's true. Matthew 8 tells us that the Son of Man had no home to call his own. But he gave them something better. He gave them the real heart of hospitality. He gave them himself. I will add to Dana's definition of true biblical hospitality this way. Hospitality is the ministry of presence. And you know this deep in your soul. You know that people are together sometimes now, and we interact on our phones a fair amount, but presence with each other, presence is incredibly rare. I first learned this when I was very pregnant with my first child, Eli. I was nine months pregnant, ready to have the second baby. Any No, I, was, I had Eli. Eli was not yet two, and Noble was in my belly. I was nine months pregnant with Noble. And a woman in my church who I barely knew, called me one day and said, hey, Aaron, come over in the morning. Leave Eli in his pajamas. You stay in your pajamas too. I want to make you breakfast. And normally I would have said, no, I, uh, I, I, I don't spend time with acquaintances. That felt uncomfortable to me. And it wasn't scheduled, but I was so desperate and so tired from a toddler on the outside of my body all the time and a baby on the inside of my body all the time that I thought, okay, here I come. So we went. Eli still in his overnight diaper and his footed pajamas, me still in my pajamas, unkempt. And she welcomed us in and she fed us pancakes. Possibly the best pancakes I'd ever had in my life. And I don't think she had a secret recipe. She just moved toward me in my point of need. And I've never asked her, I've moved away from there, we're not in each other's lives anymore, but I'm just sure that the Spirit put it on Mandy's heart to extend that invitation to me. And that brief interaction, we didn't stay all morning, but she had toys ready for Eli to play with on the floor. She had pancakes ready for me. I'm sure that God used her to help me get through those final days of pregnancy and deliver Noble into the world and get through those adjusting days. I mean, it was just pancakes. But Eli's 16 now, and I still think about it. So she really formed my understanding of hospitality. It's reaching toward others. It's a willingness to be inconvenienced. It's giving what you have, which doesn't have to be a lot, so that others can be comforted. That breakfast was a profound gift. I see uh, some big ideas from the passage, three ideas, three reasons why we show hospitality. We show hospitality because Jesus did it. He modeled it for us. Now, I'm not big on the Mediterranean diet. I don't need fish for breakfast, but I feel like that warm bread roasting over the charcoal fire just speaks, speaks to all of us. And Jesus did that for his disciples. We also show hospitality to remind each other who Jesus is. Did you notice it? The disciples got to the shore. They sat together with that warm breakfast and they reminded each other, oh, it's Jesus. This is who he is. And then Jesus used the opportunity to remind him himself. And we show hospitality as a means to fulfill the Great Commission. I don't want you to take my word for it. One more passage, Acts chapter 2. Now, we, we elevate that church in the book of Acts as perfect. They weren't. They were sinners just like us. And some of the ways that Scripture describes them were more descriptive than prescriptive. But a lot of it is also prescriptive. So listen to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they, these are those new believers right after Pentecost, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to breaking bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread, there it is again in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We know elsewhere from Scripture that thousands were coming to Christ in these days. Thousands. Because they were loving each other well. Because they were being hospitable toward each other. And it wasn't about having the best stuff. In fact, they were selling the best stuff so that they could show hospitality to each other more often. Hospitality puts the goodness of Jesus on display to a lost and hurting world. Let me ask you this. How many of you came to Christ through the practical kindness of a Christian? I got invited to go to Pizza Hut by a youth pastor. And he invited my friend and I to just, my sister and I to just go have lunch. And that was the beginning. Within a very short amount of time, she and I both surrendered our lives to Jesus and the rest is history. I'm here today uh, unapologetically elevating Jesus as the answer we all need because somebody invited me to Pizza Hut. I have a friend who came to youth group because somebody promised him there'd be brownies there. And that was enough to get him there. I have another friend um, who uh, you might know her, Rosaria Butterfield. We've had her on Grounded before. And she was invited to lunch with a pastor's family. Now, was she a believer? No. She was hostile to the gospel. But this pastor just kept inviting her over for lunch, inviting her over for dinner. And they just, the invitations kept coming and she kept accepting them because Everybody wants to make new friends. Everybody wants a great meal. Everybody wants the comfort of being in someone's home. And so they kept inviting and she kept coming until she could see the goodness of God in her own life. It, I know it feels like it should be more complicated than this, but anecdotally, I can tell you it isn't. That you can show the beauty of the gospel by opening your home. And you don't have to do it every day. What if you just did it once a week? And I could say a lot more. The Bible gives us lots of people groups we're supposed to show hospitality to. Yes, the lost. Yes, the saints. Yes, Christian workers. Yes, the hurting. You'll have to discern. You and the Spirit will have to discern who you're going to invite and when. But what I want you to do is throw out the idea that has anything to do with anything other than displaying the goodness of God through your own life. One more passage. Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Uh, we could split this two ways. We could say the application is that if you're faithful with a little bit, with a little bit of food and a little bit of home, that God's going to expand your influence. And that's probably a right application. But this is about Jesus welcoming, welcoming us into his home. This is about the fact that Jesus has hospitality in store for us. He told us when he left, I'm going to prepare a place for you. The ministry of presence will be ours. We will be in the presence of Jesus forever. So I don't want you to wait till you have a bigger house or you become a better cook or even until you feel like it. I want you to take the small stuff you make. It might just be a pancake mix and a bottle of syrup. And I want you to commit to using it to serve others in Jesus' name. But I also want you to take such great hope in the fact that Jesus is preparing a place for you. He cannot wait to welcome you into his presence forever. You want to be like Jesus today? Go and do likewise. Well, what if the Lord wasn't just asking you to invite somebody over? It doesn't even have to be for pizza. It can be for popcorn. What if the Lord wasn't just asking you to invite somebody over? What if he led you, uh, this is all about walking in the spirit, what if he led you to build a story onto your house? It happened. A one woman in Lithuania. I want you to watch this short clip and be encouraged by the power of saying yes to biblical hospitality. And I want you to watch the whole thing and stick with us because as promised, we've got some exciting good news to share. Let's watch. I work as an English teacher in my hometown, Shvinjaneli. Sandra lives in Lithuania and was introduced to Revive Our Hearts by Meta, a Revive Our Hearts ambassador. Meta came uh, into our home and we had a nice uh, morning breakfast together. I had brought some Revive Our Hearts booklets and the bookmarks, and I saw the eagerness with which she 
accepted those materials and was able to understand right away. And when I shared with her that we have a free app. I downloaded an app, and which was really great because I started listening to it every morning and it served well to my soul. Soon after she began listening to Revive Our Hearts, Sandra heard Nancy interviewing Rosaria Butterfield about hospitality. Sandra was so impacted by what she heard that she shared what she had learned with her mom and asked her a pretty crazy question. I asked her, like, do you mind if we have just another floor <laughs> added to, to the house? And she said, like, no, I don't. And this resulted in uh, building up the house and making it larger so that uh, more guests could come and stay. And this just spurred our hearts uh, to do this more. I live in a small town, so it's very quiet and tranquil there. And I think that's also one of the reasons that people really like to come step out of their busyness into the quietness and just enjoy fellowship and prayer together. We had missionaries, um, pastors, we had um, our neighbors, friends um, from all walks of life. University professors come just to relax and enjoy, spend time together uh, from different countries. For Maida, she's been greatly encouraged to see the way that Sandra has been impacted by the resources of Revive Our Hearts. Just to hear how that short visit impacted her life, that's been very encouraging. We never know which contact we make that God is going to use. Revive Our Hearts has been a great encouragement to me personally to keep going no, no matter what and to find um, true freedom in Christ no matter your circumstances. Okay, mm. I hope my invitation is in so the mail good. to go. I know. That, <laughs> that takes it all to a whole new level, huh? When God's Spirit Literally, tells you, another, or God's level. Spirit convicts you so much of the importance of biblical hospitality that you remodel your mm. house. Love it. Love it. Mm. Um, we hope that your hearts have been stirred in a similar way. Hey, I promised you a big announcement. You and did. here it is. This is my drum roll. Today, today, Reviver Hearts is releasing a brand new Bible study. It's been a while since we've released a Bible study. You've told us that you want more Bible studies from Reviver Hearts. We've listened. This one's been in production for a while, but you're just, it's just releasing today. And here's the title. You're welcome here. Embracing the heart of hospitality. Mm -hmm. Dana, as we said before, you had the idea for this episode. You didn't know that this Bible study was in the <laughs> works. Didn't. And I love it when God does that. What do you think? I'm so excited because, uh, well, first of all, isn't it just when you share something that's on your heart, that God's put on your heart, and you meet a girlfriend, and she, like, says the same verse that God stirred your heart with that morning, yep. like, it's such a, um, a, 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 a an encouragement that God is at work, right? Yeah. I believe very strongly that we must awaken our hearts mm to the task of biblical hospitality because yeah. it is not only how we share the gospel, but the word says it, as the day draws near, we've got to be practicing this so that we can yep. be reminding people of who Jesus is and pointing them to the glory and his second return. Like I, it matters yeah. to me so much. So this feels like the Lord at work. And I hope you'll yeah. get a copy of this Bible study because I'm going to be the first to do so. <laughs> and, you know, this is bigger than grounded. This is what God's doing in his church. And just like he did in Romans, we see a call to hospitality in Romans, just like yeah. he did in first Peter where Dana took us. These were times of political, cultural uh, turmoil. Yeah. And the leaders at the church, when they were telling their people what mattered, they'd say, show hospitality, show hospitality. It's not a secondary thing. It's not a fluffy doctrine at all. No. Um, it matters. And so Listen, we I want to tell you something. I think as, as, as it's getting harder and harder to invite people to church, right? You're right. Because cause they're not going to come. The, the, the days the, of just having the church doors open and people... Mm -hmm finding their way in are, are, are temporarily suspended at least if not, but over. they, w they will come have porch on the lemonade, lemonade on your porch. They You're will right. come have pizza in the living room. They will come yep. have dinner at your dining room table. This totally. matters. Yeah. Yep. And as, 
as loneliness is on a st- steep incline, we're actually set up for success here, church, because people want that ministry of presence and connectedness. And so we've loved being able to have this conversation with you. And we'd love for you to share. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to invite somebody over? How's the Lord going to stir your heart? This can be an ongoing conversation, but please uh, let us know about it. And we would love for you to be among the first to adopt this study in your own homes. This just begs to be done in groups. And we wanted you to hear about it first here on Grounded. And we want you to get a copy. Maybe we want you to get 12 copies or four copies or 18 copies um, for a neighborhood Bible study. So uh, we also want you to open your home to hungry hearted women. And we hope that if the, the beginning of this episode that gave you hives, now you understand what it means. And we hope you're excited to do it. So this Bible study, you're welcome here, is the gift of any amount at Revive Our Hearts this month, which means when you give a gift of any amount to the ministry, first of all, you're helping women walk in freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. So it's an exciting thing to partner with us mm-hmm. in that. But we will send you a copy of the study at no cost to you. It's our thank you for giving to the ministry. And there's other tools that are coming out to supplement the study. Uh, you'll be able to find out about all of that at reviveourhearts.com. Hey, Aaron, as I, I'm, as I, as we've been talking and so many memories are stirred up in my heart, memories of when you were in youth group right after that mm. youth pastor invited you out for pizza. I met you shortly yeah. after that and started. Are you going to tell them just... about the watermelon football game in the pool? Oh no, but that would be a good one. Like that. <laughs> hey, that's a form of hospitality. Grease up Absolutely. a watermelon and invite the youth yeah. group over, throw them in the pool. Your husband yeah. will have to fix the deck afterward, but <laughs> it will be a grand time. And then that all happened. Word. But that's a that's a perfect place because it was a messy night. That was a messy night. And this is what I want to say. I do think hospitality, true biblical hospitality, is messy. As yeah. I look back at the memories that you and I share when we experienced the presence of Jesus Christ together in what would be described hospitality, I see messiness. Yeah, I you're right. see I see a broken watermelon on the youth group swim night. I see you're right green beans in my net, the the screen of my um, <laughs> oh, sliding glass door because there was a food fight at another yep. youth group event. And I disruption. See... You have to disrupt maybe your kid's bedtime yes. or, you know, other and forms of messiness. I think that um, we have to be willing to put the pride of what our homes look like to, to the side. Not that God yep. doesn't love order and cleanliness sure. and all of that stuff. But I'm having my daughters and some others over tonight to bake. We're just going to have a girls' night. My mm. house is a mess. I can think of a million other things that would be productive and task-oriented me, for me to do tonight. But I want to invite the presence of Jesus into the lives of my daughters, all three yes. of them. And so my house is messy and my kitchen is open. And yeah. I hope that... Um, that you that, that whatever is keeping you from true biblical hospitality, helping people experience the presence of Christ, that you'll face it, admit it, and just move yep. it to the side. Yep. Let go of those hospitality hangups, ladies. That's it's not yeah. about any of those. It's about displaying the goodness of God. So tell us how you did it. We really want to know what yes. shifts in your life because of this. And let's wake up with hope together next week on Grounded. Mm-hmm.